Hey there and welcome to your video on topics 3.4 and 3.5 which is carrying capacity and population growth and resource availability. Um, carrying capacity, uh, this is only on two pages in your book but it's really chock full of information. Um, so uh, definitely make sure this is one of, again, those, I know I keep saying it, but it's one of those classic graphs that appears on the national exam. Um, your first question is, what is the shape of a curve that shows exponential growth? Um, it is a J curve. These are the two curves that you need to know, J curve and S curve. So if you look at the carrying capacity graph, and I'm going to spend a lot of time here, that stands for what's called exponential growth. This is what happens when uh, organisms have an infinite amount of available resources. Um, you have two organisms, and um, they have, you know, uh, four young, and each one of those has four young. So it uh, you have this exponential growth um, thing that happens, um, and then this part where it levels out uh, when it uh, when the population growth approaches. Um, Carrying capacity, that's where the S part comes in. Um, what type of populations experience um, that J-shaped curve? Um, it's right here. They reproduce at an early age, have many offspring each time they reproduce, and reproduce many times with short intervals between generations. No, duh, that would be an R-selected species. So also, guess what? That portion of the graph, that is called the R, um, the R portion of the graph right there. Um, okay, let me go back and look at the list of questions. One second. Um, what kind of conditions can enhance a population's ability to experience exponential growth? Um, so you can see right here, uh, such, such exponential growth occurs in nature when species with a high reproductive potential um, have few predators, plenty of food and other resources, and little competition from other species for such resources. Honestly, that should also ring a bell in your head because that sounds an awful lot like, um, I was just pointing at something you couldn't see, sorry. Um, it was this sentence right here. Uh, that is what invasive species do oftentimes when they get to a new space. Uh, no uh, competition they can't handle, uh, plenty of new resources, and uh, no predators to speak of. Um, what factors will inevitably limit a population's growth? Right here, there are always limits to population growth in nature. Research reveals that a rapidly growing population of any species eventually reaches some size limit imposed by limiting factors. That is a key term. These factors include sunlight, water, temperature, space, or nutrients, or exposure to predators or infectious disease. Um, so again, the name of the sum of all these factors, that's the limiting factors, and then what is the actual, what do we call all of them together? Um, that is the, um, sorry, the sum is environmental resistance, and um, that in, uh, the combination of that uh, biotic potential uh, coming up against that environmental resistance is what determines the carrying capacity. So again, you have this exponential growth of the population that is diametrically opposed to those limiting uh, factors that lead to the carrying capacity. Remember again, this line is not fixed. Um, uh, to, to zoom out and just uh, reorient you to what's going on, population size, time, this is one population of one species in one place. So um, again, let's talk about Burmese python. Their carrying capacity may be very low in their native land, um, given all of their factors, but then very high in the place where they're invading, again, for other reasons. This carrying capacity line can go up and down depending on uh, changes in the environment. Uh, has a predator been done away with? Has a new disease arisen? Um, has an invasive species come in to compete with them for resources? So again, uh, realize that this is just kind of a snapshot in time. Um, this would be if you introduce them to a brand new area and there were none of them before, you have this body potential and then hit the carrying capacity. Um, so. Again, I uh, understand everything that's going on with this graph. Um, let's see. What is an area's carrying capacity? I went over that. There's the definition right here. And um, is a carrying capacity fixed for a population or, or area? Uh, no, as I have just detailed. 
what happens to the exponential growth curve when it approaches the carrying capacity for a given population and area. Again, you have it turn into that S shape. Um, uh, look at figure 716, which we have done a lot already right there. Uh, again, note the shape of the graph once the population reaches carrying capacity. So you're, you're never going to have it just hovering here. This is where you have the up, down, up, down, up, down. Carrying capacity, the letter symbol for that is K. This is where K-selected species live, right at their carrying capacity, um, where things stay relatively the same. Uh, you can also look at this in terms of, you know, here's what pioneer species end up doing, and then here is your climax community of a forest. Same sort of idea, although it's not exact because when you go from pioneer species to climax community, you're actually changing um, what the population is, but the, the idea of the graph is very similar. I hope I didn't just confuse you. Um, I'm just trying to help you kind of tie all, all of these things together in your brain. Um, look at figure 7.17, uh, define overshoot and die-off. Pretty easy, there's your carrying capacity. Uh, overshoot is where you have some sort of conditions. Oh, you know, uh, maybe there's uh, the weather's warmer, so you have a uh, more grain than normal. So the population of organisms that eat that grain overshoot, but then winter comes and there's not enough uh, winter forage to support them all, so you inevitably crash again. So uh, the whole point of this is that this is temporary, provided the carrying capacity stays, um, stays fixed down there. Um, let's see. Recognize both on the graph. All right. What letter is associated with exponential growth? Again, that's that lowercase r. r is rate of population growth. And then k, k selected, that's the carrying capacity right there. Um, how are these rate letters related to reproductive patterns? I kind of went over that. Um, on your own, which part of the traditional carrying capacity graph relates to a fundamental niche and a realized niche? So if you remember, fundamental niche is um, you know, your, your maximum potential, uh, what you could be had you had infinite resources. So this is kind of your fundamental niche right here when you're, when you're growing, 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 but then um, that growing into your fundamental niche is limited by the carrying capacity, and this is your, your realized niche right here in terms of um, population size. Again, not an exact comparison, but trying to do some uh, tie-ins for you. Okay, uh, imagine the carrying capacity graph of the Burmese python in its native habitat. Again, we talked about it. You can have, you would probably have a lower carrying capacity there, and then um, the population in the Everglades is up here. Um, uh, because they are, they have eaten almost everything in the Everglades, that is where the carrying capacity of the Everglades is pretty much, you know, fixed here. Um, now, what can end up happening is, because they their population has grown so rapidly, you may see an overshoot. Um, this die-off doesn't necessarily mean that they all die. It could mean that they leave to find food elsewhere. So um, uh, die back again. If this is a population size in a given area, remember you can also leave an area uh, by leaving as opposed to leaving permanently, you know, life by dying. Um, all right. So anyway, definitely understand everything that there is to know about this carrying capacity graph. Um, topic 3.5 um, starts on page 189, so I'm going to flip back a little bit here. This is basically talking about how populations arrange themselves and how you determine, um, in general, uh, population changes. Um, we're not going to do the math part for a little while, um, so this is just kind of the, the facty bits. Um, define population and population size. That's all right here. Um, you know, population is a subset of a species. Population size is the number of individuals in a given area. Um, understand what can happen to a population size over time. Increase, decrease, go up and down in cycles or remain roughly the same. All right. How do scientists count large populations? Um, we've talked about that. This is where the quadrats come in. This is mark and recapture. Um, uh, so basically, it, they're all estimates. Nobody's sitting in the ocean and counting every fish that goes by. You know, you're gonna probably use a mark and recapture um, method. Uh, so here, typically they count the number of individuals in one or more small sample areas and then estimate using math. 
Look at figure 7.14. So right here. Uh, these are the three population distributions. You have clumped, uniform, and random. Uh, definitely understand um, how they are uh, similar. Well, they're not similar. They're, they're different. Uh, clumps are things like herds and forests and anywhere where organisms uh, group together. Uniform is, again, where you have very even spacing. You see this, again, with nesting sites with birds. Um, a lot of trees or uh, bushes will do this because they want to be close enough to each other where they can maximize the, the use of resources because they're obviously where they want to be, but far enough away that they aren't um, constantly competing with the thing next to them. Dandelions are a classic example of random dispersion, which is the, the, the one of the rarest. I mean, these two are pretty rare because these are uh, their seeds are dispersed by the wind, so it's totally random where they end up landing and growing. Um, so... Yeah, so there, there are some examples there of those guys. What is the most common type of distribution? Um, that's absolutely going to be your, um, your, clumped, your clumped distribution. Um, I'm just trying to find. So the verbiage on that, for those of you who want to read, is right here. So, again, um, there's all the stuff. All right. Um, uh, what four variables govern change in population size? Define each. All right, right here. Birth, death, immigration, and emigration. Immigration, remember, is you come into a population. Emigration is where you leave, you know, without dying. Uh, death is permanently leaving. Um, how does each variable influence population size? Your population goes up with birth and immigration, and it goes down with deaths and emigration. Um... Okay, we've talked about a limiting factor before. We're kind of skipping the age structure diagram stuff for right now. Um, so let's see. Limiting factors are here. Um, here, oh, I'm pointing at something you can't see. Sorry, guys. So limiting factor uh, on land, it, water is going to be your usually your limiting factor. Um, and then remember, in aquatic systems. Um, uh, remember we talked about nitrates and phosphates are important. Temperature is also important. Water depth and clarity. Um, remember that uh, light can only go so far. And so in order for photosynthesis to take place, the water needs to be clear and organisms need to be uh, where they can receive the light in the first place. So a bunch of other stuff uh, here in aquatic systems. Remember on the national exam, you really need to know that... Um, uh, the limiting factors um, in, uh, sorry, brain not working right now. In uh, It's not going to be on this quiz, but remember nitrates and phosphates are, are very big uh, limiting factors in your um, uh, freshwater and saltwater systems. Um, okay, let's see. What is population density? Population density is just the number of organisms per unit area. So if you're asked to calculate it, um, count the total number of organisms in the area, uh, calculate the area, you know, length times width, and then take the number of organisms and divide it by the, um, by the population. Uh, you have a part of your packet that um, kind of leads you through that exercise. So remember, because it's per unit area, your uh, denominator unit should be squared. Okay. Differentiate between density dependent and density independent factors that are tied to a population's density. Um, density dependent depend upon the number of organisms that are there. Their influence increases with the more organisms you have per unit area. So that is going to be predation, use of resources, disease, um, uh, parasites. Um, uh, do you realize, on the other hand, that it makes it easier for you to find mates? Um, now the other things like flood, fire, landslides, all of those abiotic disasters really are called density independent. Uh, you have one rabbit or a thousand rabbits, the landslide's going to take you out if you're in, in that given area. It doesn't matter how many or few of you there are. So um, density dependent, uh, their effect depends upon how many organisms there are in a given area. Density independent, uh, natural disasters, uh, they are 
they will cause damage no matter how many or few organisms there are in a given area. Um, tie limiting factors into the information learned in topic 3.4. Um, that's going to go into carrying capacity. Remember, the, the, the more organisms you have per unit area, which is what the carrying capacity graph tells you, the more of those density-dependent factors are going to kick in. Those are those limiting factors right here. The, these are all density-dependent. So um, there is the tie-in. Uh, look at the graph on page 201. This bad boy right here. This is a predator-prey cycle. This happens to be trouts and eagles. It could be rabbits and lynx. It could be stoats and rabbits. Um, doesn't really matter. Explain what the two lines represent. So, prey populations go up. You're gonna notice, um, okay, this is time, population size. These are two different populations. This is a population of trout. This is a population of eagles. Sorry, it always helps to orient yourself to the graph before you get started. So here, notice which peak comes first. The prey peak goes up, then the predator peak goes up. Because there are more predators, prey numbers go down, and then therefore predator numbers go down as well. Although these things are oscillating back and forth like this, you have to think that the carrying capacity is somewhere right in here. So this is a natural oscillation above and below that. Each of these organisms keeps the other one in check. You get rid of this guy, and then all of a sudden, this exponential growth that's going on uh, suddenly becomes the only thing uh, that the trout is doing, and they can um, overuse their resources and uh, possibly drive out other organisms in a given area. Um, so, and how this is an example of a density dependent factor, again, you can see when that number starts going up, which is number of organisms in a given area. Their predators also go up because you got to think that an eagle diving into the water to get a trout, it's going to be easier to get one if there's more of them there in the first place. So um, that pretty much concludes your video on topics 3.4 and 3.5.